Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Friday Reflections here at San Diego Oasis. My name is Peter Boland. It's my honor and privilege to be here with you this morning. Thank you so much for choosing to spend the, uh, the next 30 minutes with us here in this, in this growing webinar. We're so pleased that so many of you continue to return week after week. And that is uh, really, really appreciated. So thank you for that. Um, there is always a lot on your mind and there's always a lot on my mind as we navigate these, these wonderful lives, these challenging lives. Um, hi, I'm getting lots of comments. The volume is down. Here's my microphone. It's turned all the way up. I have the mic turned up on my side. Um, maybe, uh, let me take a quick look here. That might not be me, but then again, I don't know. Yes, low volume. Okay. Um, hmm. So let me just check in with everybody. Uh, is everybody having a volume problem <laughs> with me? Uh, let's see here. I'm looking for my levels. Uh, yeah. I'm turned up. Uh, That's better, Peter. Okay, I'm not having a problem. Okay, good. Thank you, Jan. All right, you sound, I sound better now. Something happened. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Okay, we're, we're all set. Yay. All right. Isn't it amazing that we can even do this? I mean, do you guys realize how many amazing miracles are happening all around us in the technological sphere, satellites and... I didn't even know the half of it or, or the quarter of it, but anyhow, it looks like most of you are getting good volume and any audio, any uh, remaining audio on your, uh, uh, might be on your end. So check your speaker settings. Thanks. All right. Let me uh, jump in here. So this is, uh, this is our third Friday reflection since we returned in February. So, uh, we're so happy to be back. I'm super happy to be back. Let me just plug real quick something coming up this coming Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, the 23rd of, Fe of February, just a few days from now. I'm doing uh, the last, my last webinar of the month, and it's, it's, it's uh, an important subject and a subject I'm very passionate and interested in. It's, it's, it's another anti-racism webinar, and it's called Why Is It So Hard to Talk About Racism? Uh, because as you've noticed, it is. It makes us feel awkward. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We, you know, that's what this webinar is about is, is getting to that, that awkwardness and, and dissecting it and trying to figure out how we can do better at, at talking about it. And, and what is my role? Just as this regular old white guy running around the world, what can I do? besides, you know, feel bad about the continuing legacy of racism? Is there anything I can concretely do? And, and let's come together in this webinar. And, and it's a safe space. This isn't about shame or blame. I'm not going to guilt, guilt anybody. This is about um, self-examination. And as a philosophy guy, that's always so interesting to me, uh, looking into the way that I think and that we think. And I think a lot of improvement can be made relatively quickly by just asking different questions. And I have a lot of good stuff for you prepared. So that's this coming Tuesday. Why is it so hard to talk about racism? So today is February 19th. And I want to uh, introduce you to my father, <laughs> because this is his birthday. Um, my father was born February 19th, 1922. So if my math is right, he would have been 99 years old today. He passed away nine years ago. This is a picture of him that I have on my desk. My mom and dad, they're always looking at me right here where I sit. And this is a picture taken in 1977 when my dad was 55 years old and my mom, Amy, was 51. So this is the moment of their of, of my father's retirement party from the Ventura Star Free Press. He was a typesetter. He worked on the printing plant side of the newspaper in Ventura. 
And that was his job my whole life. And, and by, by the time 1977 came around, I had moved out of the house. I'd gone up to Santa Barbara. I was a college student. And this is um, a, just a beloved piece of, of memorabilia that I got from my father. A really great photo here. Let me hold it a little closer so you can see them. He's holding a pen that they gave him, drinking out of some paper cups there. So that's my dad. And uh, props to him. He it was a wonderful guy. And, and someday I'll do a whole show about him. But, you know, um, he is ashes now. And so is my mother. And they are both ashes in two different urns in a, in a cache in, at Ivy Lawn Memorial Cemetery in Ventura. And every time I go to Ventura, I get off on the Victoria Avenue off ramp. And that's right where Ivy Lawn is. I always drop by and pay my respects and, and uh, touch, touch the, the, their, their names. And um, I'm really glad that they did that, that they decided to invest in that so that we have a place to go. And, you know, it's, it's coming all coming back for me because a couple of days ago, Wednesday was of course, Ash Wednesday. And I shared with you last week, if you were here, that for the first time in my life, I'm participating in this ancient ritual. It has its roots all the way back to the book of Genesis, but it's a particularly Christian ritual, this business of Ash Wednesday. So Tuesday, last Tuesday was Mardi Gras or Car Carnival, you know, the festival of the flesh. And then Wednesday begins this 40 day period in Christianity called Lent. And we went all through that last week. And many of you wrote me to talk about um, uh, to talk about your own experience with Lent and, and whether you do it or not. And, and so I'm trying it out for the first time. And, you know, when the, the way it happened, of course, since churches are closed, I, I drove by last Saturday and picked up my little bag of consecrated ashes made from the burned palm fronds from last year's Palm Sunday. And then on Wednesday, I got up and I watched a YouTube service uh, and, at the right moment, you put your thumb in the ash and you make the cross on your forehead while the priest says the words, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. Which is, of course, Genesis 3. And it, it's such a beautiful, it was a really powerful thing to, to put that ash on my forehead and to sort of meditate on impermanence. And that's, of course, what this is about, that that all of these material forms around us are fleeting, as Buddha said, you know, his dying words to his, who his brother monks, uh, remember this, that all forms are impermanent. And so this is not unique to the Christian tradition, of course, but here it is ritualized in Ash Wednesday, which kicks off this period of uh, Lent, this period of letting go, learning how to let go of things that you thought were important and Different people pick different things. In traditional Christian circles, especially in Catholic circles, they're fasting, um, giving up your favorite food or whatever, or taking on different practices, different prayer and meditation. Um, I'm, I'm reaching for the Katha Upanishad, which is taken from Ignati Swaran's amazing translation of the Upanishads. All seekers should have this book in their house. And uh, my favorite of the Upanishads, which are these wisdom texts from a thousand or so BC in India associated with Hinduism. My favorite of the Upanishads is the Katha Upanishad. I just shot three uh, videos, a three-part series parts one, two, and three called the Katha Upanishad. It's, it's on my YouTube channel now. I know a lot of you know about my YouTube channel. If you don't, uh, next time you're on YouTube, search search my name. It's called Peter Boland TV. And it's, I don't know, over a hundred videos now of me giving little mini lectures about religion and spirituality and mythology. And the three newest ones are about the Katha Upanishad. It's, it's a beautiful dialogue. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a unique Upanishad because it's a, it's a dramatic scene. It's, a, it's like a one-act play with two characters. This spiritual seeker called Nashikita, this 12, 13-year-old boy, goes to visit Lord Yama, who is the Lord of Death. And he wants to ask Lord Yama a very important philosophical question what is death? Or the way he exactly puts it is, it, 
is there anything that happens after you die? Some people say when you die, you go on in some other form. Other people say when you die, it's lights out and that's it. Which is it, Lord Yama? And he goes right to the guy who's in charge of death in the Hindu pantheon. So you think if anybody knows, Lord Yama knows. And for the next, you know, 20 pages, Lord Yama teaches this boy all kinds of things about what ultimate reality is, you know, those of you that have worked with me before on the Danta philosophy, Brahman, Brahmanat, Brahmanatman, the, the nameless, formless, sacred ground of being that is the source of all forms, yet is itself formless. It's the source of time and space, yet is itself a, a temporal or eternal and everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> so a very mysterious mystical concept, right? The ground of being. Um, not even personified as a god in Hinduism. So I want to share with you a passage from the from the Kapta Upanishad right toward the end, um, where Lord Yama is, is explaining to Nashikita, the spiritual seeker boy, the nature of who we are and what death is. So Lord Yama says, there are two selves, the separate ego and the indivisible Atman. And again, remember the Atman translated in English often as capital S self is the changeless, unborn, undying Brahman presence within all sentient beings. It's what we are unborn and undying. So Lord Yama says, there's two of you. There's two of you. There, there, there's your ego self. In my case, Peter Bolin, this guy with ambitions and plans and fears and stuff. And then there's the indivisible Atman. When one rises above I and me and mine, the Atman is revealed as one's real self. So when I let go of my slavish attachments to I, me and mine, you know, my house, my wife, my car, my plan, my garden, my body. When I let go of all that I, me, mine talk and I slip into the humility of, of boundless consciousness and I let go, I know that I am ashes, that this body came into being and will go out of being. When I rise above I and me and mine, the Atman is revealed as one's real self. And then Lord Yama goes on and kind of puts a bow on it. He says, when all desires that surge in the heart are renounced or let go, the mortal becomes immortal. When all the knots that strangle the heart are loosened, the mortal becomes immortal. And then he says, this sums up the teaching of the scriptures. So that passage is, that passage from the Kathi Upanishad is, according to Lord Yama, the summation of all Vedanta philosophy. And it reminds me so much, really, of, of this Lent period of this ashes ritual to meditate on our impermanence. You know, in, there's a passage in the Kathi Upanishad where it says, in the city of 11 gates, and then it goes on and on, and you're like, what's the city of 11 gates? And then you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's the body. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight is my navel, and then nine, ten down there below the camera. That's 10. What's the 11th gate? Well, the 11th is at the crown of the head that in the embryo, you know, the, the skull was different plates that kind of came together. So there was an opening that kind of closed before birth, hopefully. And, you know, the infant, the newborn infant is sort of soft. And, and that's called the Brahman passage. And that's the crown chakra where God consciousness gets in and gets out. You know, that's the connective point in Indian thought between you and Brahmanatman, you know, ultimate reality. And I was thinking about that in reference to the way it felt, the way it kind of felt in my body when I put those ashes on my forehead, because that's not the seventh chakra, but that's the sixth chakra in Indian cosmology. The seven chakras from the groin to the crown, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
And the sixth chakra is called in Sanskrit, it's called um, Ajna, A-G-N-A, Ajna, meaning inner wisdom, intuition, um, nonlinear thought, uh, transrational knowing. And it, it's, it struck me as, again, and this, this hits me every day in my work because I'm always working across boundaries and all these different wisdom traditions how archetypal this stuff really is and how connected this stuff really is. And it, it all brought up for me a, a memory. And, you know, we're all spending so much time alone. And since I've gave up Facebook for Lent, I don't have that to do anymore. So um, I was thinking about London. And last time Lori and I were in London was back in 2018. And we put a trip together to London and Paris because we'd never, we'd, we'd been to London, but we'd never been to Paris. So, um, we put together a trip to London and Paris. And it was uh, three or four days in London and three or four days in Paris on a tour, you know, a group thing where, you know, you get in a bus and they take you around and they take you to different places. And we thought, well, that's probably a good way to do Paris the first time. Let's get led around and show around because I don't speak a word of French. The only French word I know is, you know, baguette. And it was a big triumph for me when I was in Paris to learn the difference between bonjour and bonsoir. And I get them mixed up and waiters would look at me funny, but I got that worked out, darn it. But back, back to London. Um, we of course flew in three days early and had our own private time running around London. But after three days went by, we, we checked into the hotel with the group that had just got off the plane and we started our group tour and, you know, group tours are, I don't know how you feel about it. Of course we all miss travel like crazy, but group tours have their, good points and their, and their limitations. You know, it's kind of a drag to get on and off a bus all day and have to look at your watch and be told where to be when. And, but the good news is you get really expert leadership and, and teaching, constant teaching about what you're seeing. Um, and so overall, it was a really great experience. And you meet some great people. And, and I, I, I was thinking back on one young woman that we met. Her name was, I'll, I'll call her Rose. She was about 35, I would guess, African-American woman from New Jersey, I think. And um, we, we started kind of buddying up with her and, and, and she was on her own, right? She was traveling alone. And so she piled up with us and the three of us, you know, would eat dinners and stuff together. And it quickly became clear that she had some medical condition issues because she, she was, seemed healthy when you were talking to her, but she was always wheeling around with her uh, kind of a travel suitcase, but a very special looking one. And as more became revealed, it was a cooler and it had lots of uh, prescription drinks in it. Anyway, she had um, had a number of serious digestive tract medical issues and had lost most of her intestines, most of her digestive system. She had a, a shunt coming out for, in, uh, for direct feeding. And she had a very complex medical regime all day, all night and had trouble sleeping and she had these special prescription shakes that she had to drink and and it was fascinating being with her because you know i have my own little anxieties about travel i'm perfectly healthy but i have all these anxieties about travel i don't like being cramped in an airplane seat for 12 hours flying across the atlantic and i you know i'm kind of an introvert and i'm nervous around people i don't like parties and and um Travel is basically you're getting thrust into rooms full of strangers all day long, every day. And it's kind of exhausting, right? The, one of the sweetest things about travel is coming home. Yay, my bed. <laughs> and then you can't wait to go again. So, But um, be, spending time with Rose really put into perspective my complacency at how, how dumb luck I have to be so healthy and able to travel so easily compared to her. And yet she got on the plane, laid down the thousands of dollars to take this trip and said, damn it, I'm going to go on this trip. Even though I have this gnarly, you know, condition that has all this care and I have to be really careful what I eat and, and, and you're on and off buses and you don't, you can't always get to a bathroom. I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but that was an enormous challenge for her. Um, you know, taking care of all those sort of root needs that the body has, especially in her condition. So it was very inspiring to be with her. And, and, and I never forget one day, you know, 
uh, we all piled on the bus at the hotel and went to Windsor Castle and had an amazing tour there. And, you know, being in the chapel where, where, where Megan and Harry had been married just like a few weeks before. And, and you're in the chapel where they got married and, and there's sarcophagi just all around. You know, here's, there's dead bodies of former kings and queens in boxes right around where the people were sitting where they were getting married. I, I love how other cultures do that, how they, they integrate death into life a little more readily. You know, we tend to hide death way away on the fringes. The cemetery is always like way outside of town. You have to drive a ways to get there. But here, Megan and Harry, these gorgeous, beautiful young people in their prime were getting married in a room full of tombs. And after Windsor Castle, which was amazing, uh, we were supposed to go to Westminster Abbey. So you get in the bus at, out at Windsor Castle, and it's like a half hour ride back into London, into the Westminster district. And we were supposed to go to Westminster Abbey, but um, the tour had been canceled. And our tour guide told us, I'm sorry, but we got a call today, the no tours today, Westminster Abbey is closed. So we're just going back to the hotel. So we said, okay, um, I'll tell you what, can you drop us off at Harrods? Because I wanted to spend the afternoon shopping because I love shopping. And Harrods is, as many of you know, is this absolutely magnificent, legendary, over-the-top, awesome department store in London. So the bus stopped and uh, Lori and I got off and, and Rose said, hey, can I tag along? And, and my first thought was, you know, I really wanted some alone time with me and Lori. Can we just be free from this group? But then, I, but Rose is cool. I'm like, sure, what the heck? Come along. I thought maybe she doesn't have anybody to hang around with. We're just going to walk through this. Of course, come with us. So, uh, but it was funny to notice my initial, you know, I'm a turtle. I want to crawl back in my shell, please. But um, anyway, it was amazing. And so Rose came with us with her little cart and we got inside Harrods in the food court and we were sampling caviar. Now, I'm not even much of a fish guy. I'm, I'm doing better. I'm eating salmon and trout, and but I can't do shellfish. Like, like I mean, clams and stuff. I'm like, ew. Um, I do like shrimp. Uh, but anyway, caviar, like that's the last thing I want to eat is a bunch of fish eggs, right? But when in Rome, you know, and I'm at Harrods and they have this beautiful case with caviar and there's a sales guy in, in, inside of it. And he's up on a platform looking down at you and this beautiful cases of caviar. Lori uh, was really interested and, and so was Rose. And so I'm like, oh, okay. And the clerk inside there really took to us. He was bored out of his mind. Nobody was buying caviar. He was all alone in a crowded store. And so he saw, you want to try some? We're like, sure. And he took us on the tour of caviar. We tasted every kind of caviar stuff that's like five hundred dollars for a little can this big and he was just dishing it out you know he taught us it you know you may put it on your hand right here in the spot and you just eat it and notice the distinction this the slight smokiness the slight you know the flavor of the ocean here and etc cetera, etc cetera. and it struck me i'm eating eggs which I eat chicken eggs pretty frequently, but this is something that was supposed to turn into a baby. This was supposed to be a baby sturgeon and we're eating eggs. And it just, it's so weird, isn't it? How, how life and death are just always so linked together. And after we got done with Harrods, we got back in, in the, uh, we, we caught a cab back to the hotel, which is all the way across London. Normally a 10 minute, 15 minute drive took us about 40 minutes because traffic was snarled and our cab driver went down along the, the uh, Thames, along, along the river. It seemed to be to him the best route. And so we're stuck in London traffic, just kicking back. It's three, four in the afternoon and we're heading back to the hotel. And all of a sudden in this traffic snarl, we're going about two miles an hour. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, over by the river, there's a bunch of bicycles going by. I'm like, oh, it's a bike race. And then I realize they're all naked. <laughs> and then our driver goes, yeah, it's the, uh, it's the World Naked Bike Ride Day. And I guess it's this global thing that happens once a year in Tokyo and Hong Kong and Seattle and London. I don't know where all. But <laughs> riding by on their bikes were all these naked people. And I thought... Well, first, it strikes you the novelty of seeing so many penises and breasts swinging around on bicycle seats. It's like, that doesn't look comfortable. And then it strikes you what a taboo that is 
and, and how gleefully these people were shattering this taboo. And let me say something you're probably all thinking, which is the kind of person who would take their clothes off and ride their bike around with all their friends in London, uh, these weren't, shall, shall I put this de delicately, these weren't swimsuit models. These were ordinary people like me who you don't really want see naked and and it was it was once the novelty wears off and this this was a long train of bicycles i mean i don't know hundreds and hundreds of them it took a long time for them to roll by and uh it just struck me again how frail and how ordinary and you know these the we these these bodies are these these people it wasn't a sexual thing. They weren't trying to seduce anybody. It wasn't showing off. It wasn't, it wasn't anything. It was just the ordinariness of our material form in a kind of curious display. And, and that sort of brought it all sort of back into a circle. And then the next morning in the, in the, in the paper, we, we uh, read that the reason Westminster Abbey was closed was because the queen was there for the internment of Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking, the eminent scientist, was being laid to rest in, in a tomb in the floor of Westminster Abbey, right next to Charles, Dar Charles Darwin and Isaac Newton, because that's how they roll in London, right? These are national tombs and Westminster Abbey, you know, there's the literary side over there with all the great writers, and here's the science guys over here and again, bringing death right into the place where we celebrate life, where we celebrate the eternal, where we celebrate that formless Brahmanatman, which is hidden behind the veil of all of this coming and going, which is symbolized for us by, by the ashes. And what a great teacher death is because, and I'll put it this way, what a great friend death is. And what a great friend Rose was. And I don't even know if she's alive. We lost touch with her. And, and how, how poignant it is to go forth in life, knowing we're going to die anyway, to go forth in life with all of our ailments and our woundedness and our aches and pains and just grab life anyway. And, and what a great teacher and what a great friend death is because it breaks our heart because it breaks our slavish attachment to ourselves, to our egos, to the illusion that we own any of this or that we are in control of any of this. Death hanging over our head is doing us a huge favor. I think a lot about my mom and dad as they look at me uh, right behind my computer monitor and how beautiful they are and, and how they're ash now. And that is all part of, for me, the reflection of, of really what Lent is about and, and what we all in the philosophic life, we don't need Lent to do this, right? We do this in any tradition. We do this any week. So let me, let me close with a uh, poem that I found that kind of gets to some of this. And, and I was walking today. I don't know if you can see this, but I found an owl pellet, an owl pellet. Can you see the little skull here, the little teeth? And can you see, let me see if I can show you where is it, the hand right there. See the little fingers, the little delicate little squirrel hand or vole or rat or something. This, I found this out in the field behind the house, right below where we saw a barn owl perched a few mornings ago in the dark pre-dawn. And I'm like, if there's an owl, there's probably an owl pellet. Sure enough, we found it. This is after they eat the mammal, they just all the barts they don't want get kind of spit back out. And it reminded me of this Billy Collins poem called Aimless Love. So we'll close here. Billy Collins, Aimless Love. This morning as I walked along the lake shore, I fell in love with a wren. And later in the day with a mouse, the cat had dropped under the dining room table. In the shadows of an autumn evening, I fell for a seamstress, still at her machine in the tailor's window, and later for a bowl of broth, steam rising like smoke from a naval battle. This is the best kind of love, I thought, without recompense, without gifts or unkind words, without suspicion or silence on the telephone the love of the chestnut, 
the jazz cap and one hand on the wheel. No lust, no slam of the door, the love of the miniature orange tree, the clean white shirt, the hot evening shower, the highway that cuts across Florida. No waiting, no huffiness, no rancor, just a twinge every now and then for the wren who had built her nest on a low branch overhanging the water and for the dead mouse still dressed in its light brown suit. But my heart is always propped up in a field on its tripod, ready for the next arrow. After I car carried the mouse by the tail to a pile of leaves in the woods, I found myself standing at the bathroom sink, gazing down affectionately at the soap. So patient and sol soluble, so at home in its pale green soap dish. I could feel myself falling again as I felt its turning in my wet hands and caught the scent of the lavender and stone. Billy Collins, Aimless Love. Thank you, my friend, for another Friday Reflections. I appreciate you all so much. Have a great week. Hope to see some of you Tuesday at Why It's So Hard to Talk About Racism. And of course, next Friday for another Friday Reflections. Bonjour. <laughs>